I'm, I'm Tony Venables from, from Oxford and on the steering group of uh, the IGC. So obviously it's a great pleasure uh, for me to welcome you all here uh, to this event uh, and, and, and to the lecture tonight. Uh, as you see, it's a really important uh, topic, really important title, uh, Financing Infrastructure Investment in Africa. Uh, probably most of you have some sense of the, the magnitude of the challenge involved here. Um, something like the order of $100 billion a year is the sort of flow of funds that are needed uh, to, to get African infrastructure uh, up to scratch. And that's, that's certainly a doubling of the levels uh, that, that, that are going in presently. When I think about these things, I always think about spending the money um, rather than raising it. Uh, but raising it is rather important. So tonight we have a group of people who know about the financing aspects, uh, the financing side. Let me say a couple of words uh, to introduce them. So the main speaker uh, is, is Professor Paul Collier. Uh, all of you will know him uh, by reputation and many of you will have heard him speak before, uh, I'm sure. Obviously he, uh, he set up the Centre for the Study of African Economies in Oxford, which has really been one of the major, well the major uh, research centre uh, for work in Africa. He's a widely published author academically and, in, uh, and more popularly, uh, The Bottom Billion uh, became a, a bestseller. And also he's enormously influential uh, in policy circles. So most recently he was uh, Prime Minister's advisor uh, to, the, to the G8 summit and really shaped the agenda of um, sorting out tax, uh, getting our own houses in order on, on tax and corruption. So Paul will be the, uh, the first speaker uh, who will speak for, for 30 minutes or so. Uh, we then have two, 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 two discussants. Uh, Keith Palmer uh, is, is, is the first. He's the founder and chair uh, of, of the Emerging Africa uh, Infrastructure Fund, which is a public-private pu uh, partnership that is really channeling large amounts of money, uh, 750 million, I believe, is the current, current stock, uh, in, into financing infrastructure uh, in Africa. So he's an expert who knows you know, on, the, on the ground uh, the reality uh, of, of, of doing business. He's the first discussant. Uh, the, the, the second uh, discussant uh, is Antonio Estash, who's a professor at, at ICAR at uh, ULB, University Libre de Bruxelles, an expert on uh, public finance, regulation, uh, industrial economics, uh, but also uh, was chief economist for infrastructure and then sustainable development more widely uh, in the World Bank for some years. So once again, uh, an academic, uh, but with real uh, policy experience uh, in the World Bank and in working with countries on this. So we've got a, a terrific lineup here. Uh, Paul will go first, then, uh, then obviously the, the two discussants. We'll have time for questions at the end, but I will wait till the end before soliciting questions. But I hope we will get a lively debate going. So, so think of your questions, the things you want to raise and challenge people on. Uh, th think about your questions uh, as we go through. There are a couple of LSE housekeeping things, some of which I'm sure I'll forget. Um, this is being recorded and will probably be podcast, but b b be aware uh, that it's being recorded. Um, there's uh, some hashtag, hashtag stuff there uh, that you should be aware of. Uh, if, you're, if you're tweeting uh, as, as, as you go, uh, and with that, I'll hand over to Paul to kick off. Well, thanks very much, Tony. Um, in the interest of, uh, of not confusing the audience, um, let me say I've got a book coming out next week, which you may have seen publicity for, Exodus. Um, this talk has absolutely nothing to do with that book. Um, uh, I should also say I'm more unusually uh, apprehensive in giving this talk. I, a, a generally, a, a sound rule for speakers is talk about something you know about. Um, I've sort of come into this topic um, not because of, uh, I'm an expert, um, but because uh, once I started addressing the, the, the G8 agenda, I thought this really mattered. 
and so I've done my best to try and get up to speed in a topic that I think is really important, um, but I'm confronted by two people who are more expert in their different perspectives than I am. So um, we'll see. Um, the opportunity for getting private finance into African infrastructure, at least on the face of it, seems enormous. That first of all, you're confronted with acute infrastructure needs, um, needs which have actually become more acute thanks to Africa's uh, growth. Over the last decade, Africa has grown. We heard about it last night. Um, but if you remember the, the diagnostics of why it had grown, um, one thing that wasn't an explanation was a surge in investment, in particular a surge in infrastructure investment. That hasn't happened. Africa's grown, but it hasn't had a big surge in infrastructure investment, and so it's a much bigger economy than it was a decade ago, much more activity, but there isn't a lot more infrastructure. And so what was something that was already short a decade ago is now even scarcer. So that's the need, and it's way beyond existing sources of finance. Um, Meanwhile, um, what we observe uh, in the aftermath of the financial crisis, we observe huge liquid pools of private capital where <coughs> the risk-free rate of return on private capital is zero. And so here's an astounding, superficially astounding mismatch, a vast pool of money willing to accept zero return and a vast need for finance, for finance of utilities, which are after all uh, in the OECD classified as a very low risk uh, investment. So, and yet there's virtually no flow, virtually no flow from that private capital pool into uh, African infrastructure. Uh, obviously the Chinese flow but not from the OECD capital markets. So why is that? Um, now it could be that actually the, the need for African infrastructure is kind of illusory. That, that people talk about need but even the social rate of return on African infrastructure will be low. Um, I think in one or two countries you can actually make that argument. Um, but when you're making it, you're, it's tantamount to saying these places can't develop. Because any society that develops has enormous needs for infrastructure. So as a general explanation of, of, of the failure of uh, capital to be attractive into African infrastructure, that explanation just can't be right. Now it could be that there are high social returns and low private returns, uh, but if that's the combination, even that would have to be explained because um, not only recently has a lot of infrastructure in the OECD been financed by private capital, which is clearly the case, but it has been since the 18th century. <coughs> if, you look at, if you look at Britain, um, the road map of Britain um, from 1700 to 1800 was transformed into a road structure which looks very similar to what we've got now, minus the motorways, and that was, entire, that was private capital, overwhelmingly, the turnpike roads. In the 19th century, across the OECD, you got rail infrastructure. Again, pretty well entirely private capital. So um, there's nothing intrinsic about a lot of infrastructure classes which prevents them being privately funded. Um, What's more, even at the moment where African infrastructure offers high private rates of return, it's a struggle attracting finance. Um, one of the um, uh, infrastructure projects that, um, that Dr. Palmer, I think, has financed, is, is, or is financing, is a, an electricity project in, uh, in, in um, Ghana. Ghana is the, the, the really the, about the, the lowest risk environment you could think of in Africa. 
Um, and that project, I believe, offered a, an equity rate of return of 20%. Um, when I last talked about this in, I think, June, um, uh, it was proving a real struggle to attract private capital. I believe now that private capital has been attracted, which is good, but 20% but as a rate of return needed to entice in private capital, um, that is... Um, a, in effect a killer for finance of infrastructure. You cannot finance Africa's infrastructure needs at rates of return like 20%. Um, what seems to, be, to have happened is that projects like that, which in the OECD will be classified, will be conceptualized as a utility and therefore very safe, because they're in Ghana are classified as frontier market activity and therefore wildly risky. Yeah. So the, the, the same project changes categories between a very low risk and a very high risk category when you move it uh, from uh, the OECD to Ghana. Um, so my talk is going to explore is there an opportunity for, for private finance? Now, in a way, we know that at the moment there isn't, otherwise private finance would be there. Private finance is not stupid. Um, so the, that question rapidly turns into, is there um, an opportunity for public finance to catalyze private finance? For public finance to go where private finance is unwilling to go? And of course the, the seemingly smart response to that is that if it's not a good private investment, why on earth should it be a good public investment? Um, so first, just let's tackle that, that question. And there's a simple answer to that, which is that uh, private and public investors should use very different bases for evaluation. Um, even if they share exactly the diagnosis of the, the risks of the project and so on, uh, a project could be far too risky to be appropriate for a private portfolio relative to the return on it and yet be a very good risk reducing project for a public development agency. Why? Because the public development agency is not there to maximize return on a portfolio, it's there to try and at a minimum prevent states from failing. And so it may well be that some high risk projects actually reduce the risk of a, of a state failing even though they'd be a rotten investment in a private portfolio. So that's the sort of generic argument, and that's, that's why you've got entities like CDC, IFC, etc. Um, I'm going to argue that to date they haven't been very strategically used. But for public money to catalyze private money, that's what we're going to explore. Can the insertion of public money not just substitute for private capital that won't go there, but then catalyze a process by which private capital then becomes attractive. And the argument I'm going to build up is that there are three blocks of obstacles to private finance in African infrastructure, three very distinct blocks, which we can think, think of as there's, a, there's no pipeline, there's very high risk, and uh, there's inappropriate regulation. So there's going to be some impediments. Why isn't there a pipeline of projects already? Second, why is risk so high? What can we do to reduce it? And then third, what can we do to improve regulation? Um, and so that's the agenda. And I'm going to start with why are then is there no pipeline of bankable African infrastructure projects? <coughs> And I'm going to have two answers to that, um, not alternatives but complements. The, the first answer is that preparing an African infrastructure project to be bankable requires a highly specialist team and to a first approximation we don't have them. Um, and the specialist team has to combine both technical skill and political skill. The Ghana electricity project, which I spoke about, um, took eight years to prepare 
for market. Eight years. Now one thing that tells us is that um, there were an enormous number of political impediments to getting the project ready for market. So you need that combination of technical and political skills. African governments lack the technical skills, especially the economic skills that can prepare a project and sh show to private investors that this has a decent return. I do a lot of work with African governments, typically chairing uh, investor conferences, where the government sort of pitches to private investors. And when it comes to infrastructure, uh, commonly what African governments present is a long wish list of projects which are de where what is demonstrated is we need this project. But what is not demonstrated is why would it be a wise thing for you to put your money in it. Uh, and to do that latter thing, you've got to address rates of return, risks. Um, for example, as I'll turn to in a moment, um, there's a very severe political hold-up problem with uh, infrastructure projects. So the first thing that African government would need to address uh, is first recognize that hold-up problem and then say how are you going to deal with it? Why this investor shouldn't be frightened by that problem? And I've never heard that addressed. So that's the lack of technical skills and economic skills in particular. But there's also, even when you turn to the private teams, you can get those technical skills on the consultancy market. But what is much harder to get and to twin up with the technical skills is the political skills. Um, the skills to overcome a lot of veto points. Um, I've sort of conceptualized that, maybe foolishly, as what is needed is political entrepreneurship of a very high caliber. Um, and such people are rare. Um, I know of only one um, private uh, infrastructure team uh, which combines that. High level political clout with technical expertise. And it's too early to say whether that's successful because it's a startup. Um, so that's the first impediment to the pipeline. There just aren't the teams out there that have the combination of specialist skills. And then the second reason, which is much more conventional, is to say what is needed in infrastructure projects is standardization. At the moment, African infrastructure projects are highly idiosyncratic. That's why that Ghana project took eight years. And idiosyncratic projects, because if every project is totally unique, that inflates the information costs of uh, of the transaction. Standardization lowers transaction costs in two ways. The obvious one is that uh, a, 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 an investor needs to just to get a single set of costs of information uh, to, uh, to understand a whole class of, of investment. So that's the obvious one. Standardization just turns idiosyncratic into, into, stand, into standard. But the, the more subtle one is that once you uh, have got standardization, then it becomes worthwhile to make sure that, that the, the standard you adopt uh, is simple. And sim simple um, is, is cheap to use by definition but actually simple is difficult to design. Um, there's a famous letter um, which ends, um, I apologize uh, that this letter is so long, I didn't have time to write a short one. Uh, and that sort of encapsulates the idea that actually simplicity is complicated. Uh, and so designing a standard package which is easy uh, is hard work. So that's the, um, just let me give you one sort of example of that. Um, 
This is a, a Kenyan electricity project. There are very, very few African electricity projects that are actually up and running. Um, it's a Kenyan one where the legal document for the offtake agreement, the legal document is a thousand pages long. Now that's idiosyncrasy uh, um, embodied. Um, if it's a thousand pages long legal document, nobody is going to um, invest in finding out about it. The entry costs of information are just too high. Now the offtake agreement document in India that I saw is 20 pages long. So it's possible to get these things much simpler. A 20 page document financiers can actually digest, does this, does this make sense? So we need standardization. Markets are extremely bad at delivering standardization autonomously. Um, throughout history, um, uh, standards have been provided as a public good. Think of weights, think of measures, think of protocols. They've all been done by government activity. They are a public good. And so we need uh, that public good of standardization here. But, of course, the, the dilemma is um, uh, we're now talking about international standardization. This is not something that a national government produces. It's something that has to be pan-African. So the obvious uh, entity to provide that, in my view, is the African Development Bank, um, which is indeed um, financing a lot of infrastructure projects across the continent. And so it's sensible that it produces absolutely standardized packages. We'll see why standardized packages also come back, have a further use. So that's how I would suggest addressing the pipeline um, problem, the, a combination of a supply of specialist teams with this combination of political entrepreneurship as well as technical skills and uh, the introduction of standards. Let me turn from the pipeline, filling the pipeline, why is there at the moment no pipeline of bankable projects, and now let me turn to that uh, that very high level of risk, 20% plus risk. We need to de-risk African infrastructure projects. So how do we de-risk? Um, first, let's just look at that hold-up problem which I mentioned. Um, and I'm going to give you seven uh, components of the political risk of infrastructure which cumulatively should chill your bones. Put yourself in the position of a possible, you know, this might be your money. <coughs> this might be your pension right, money that is being put in. So, one, the infrastructure investment is irreversible and it's single function. You can't get it out and you can't change it into something else. Um, two, even when it's being built there's a load of risks because building infrastructure uh, causes uh, damage to the locality in which the infrastructure is installed and that produces political pushback. Yeah. You don't have to think Africa, you just think Britain. Right? Um, we're trying to build a high speed train and there's pushback all along the, the, the prospective line. Right? Um, three, um, Infrastructure is often, not invariably, but often a network activity. Network activities we know need regulation because there's an inherent tendency to monopoly with network activities, so they need regulation. We know that when you regulate something, the regulator needs an element of discretion. But in a poor governance environment such as much of Africa, giving discretion to a regulator uh, creates concerns, legitimate concerns, about corruption. So you've got another layer of risk coming. So irreversible, construction risk, network risk. Fourth, um, the, the, the output of uh, infrastructure is usually politically sensitive because citizens perceive the government has an obligation uh, 
uh, to either affect its quality or especially its price. And so there's, a, there's a, an off-stage risk that the government will interfere to uh, either reset the price or say the quality is too, not good enough or something like that. Fifth, even worse, the government is often uh, a customer and sometimes the only customer for this infrastructure. Um, sixth, the infrastructure is long-lasting <coughs> uh, and that means the horizon for government interference is very long. No matter what the present government says, you're going to have to worry about what the next government and the government after that and the government after that says. And finally, um, a corollary of this stuff lasting an awful long time is that your contracts are going to be incomplete. You just cannot anticipate everything that's going to happen over a 40-year horizon. Incomplete contracting means you're going to be back at the negotiating table. So, that is cumulatively a pretty chilling list uh, of, of, of political risks. How can we reduce them? Well, um, the, uh, the first approach is indeed to reduce risk through political commitment technologies. Um, you can do political commitment technologies without any public um, involvement. Um, for example, dispute settlement boards are like that. The, the government will enter into an agreement with a company as to how the, any dispute is to be settled, and that will not require any um, sort of uh, OECD level public involvement. Um, the Chinese often do that with, uh, with their projects. Um, they don't trust their own laws, so they insist that the project be judged under the law of England and Wales. Um, by a dispute settlement board. Um, but dispute settlement boards are very much a sort of in your face affront to sovereignty. Uh, and so they are uncomfortable territory. Um, can we do commitment technologies which are a little bit more subtle um, and the, the, the sovereignty issue is softened and a bit disguised? Um, I'm going to suggest one. Um, where, which we already have, which will surprise you um, because you won't think of it as a commitment technology, uh, and that is um, the public political risk insurance agencies, the World Bank's agency, MEGA, and the American agency, OPIC. Um, superficially, these are not commitment technologies, they're uh, insurance. Right? Um, but actually, that's superficial. Um, if you look at um, the, the, the structure of, uh, of MEGA, for example, MEGA financing, um, MEGA pays out like an insurance company, um, but what it then does is claim the money back from the governments that triggered the, uh, the, 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 the offence. Um, and MEGA is able to recover a very large percentage of all the money it pays out. So it's not really, uh, it's less in the business of insurance than in the business of a recovery uh, of enforcing a set, a set of commitments. So MIGA at the moment is more like a piece of political commitment technology in disguise. Nothing wrong in that, very good thing. Um, potentially you could do other things like that. I advocated standardization by the African Development Bank, one of the things that could be included in standardization is a standard timetable. I mean, eight years to, private, to, to, to get private financing into uh, an electricity project is a killer. And so uh, part of standardization could be this is the timetable we're going to follow. And that is implicitly a sort of political commitment technology. Yeah, a government commit in, in saying we're going to adopt <coughs> that African Development Bank standard, it's a commitment technology to a timetable. So all that is one way of, of de-risking. You get commitment technologies. Another way is indeed genuine insurance. And you've already got that MEGA is indeed, in a small element, an insurance company. I just need scaling up. Um, enormously scaling up. 
uh, until recently, MIGA basically avoided Africa. Why? Well, it thought Africa was risky. Of course it is. That's why we got MIGA. Um, and so it was, it was an absurdity that, uh, that, that MIGA walked away from the, the territory where it was most needed. But it did. Um, the last 18 months, I think it's scaled up fourfold. Um, it's easy to do that when you start with a very low number. Um, I would also want to suggest that paying the insurance premium, paying the MIGA premium, is an entirely legitimate use of aid. And at the moment, there seems to be no mechanism for that. Um, I just can see no reason why Ida cannot be shuffled across the street into MIGA, um, where it is strategically important uh, to, to de-risk uh, a particular country. Um, so, we've got uh, commitment technologies, we've got insurance, uh, the next thing we can do is rebundle risk. And if you look at the lifetime of a project, it goes through three phases which have very different uh, risk and capital requirements. So there's the phase of project preparation, that eight years, um, where uh, it's the catalytic phase. The risks are high, but the capital needs are rather low. And then you get into another phase where you, of construction, where the risks are high and the capital needs are enormous. And then you get a third phase of operation where the risks are low, but the capital needs are enormous. So how would you want to fund that? Well, the catalytic phase, because it doesn't require a lot of money, that's suitable for private funding. The construction phase, because it's high risk, probably needs some public risk capital. It's hungry for capital, and it probably needs a, a big chunk of public risk capital. But there isn't very much public risk capital, so it's vital not to tie it up for 50 years whilst the infrastructure gradually depreciates. And so it's vital that, you, that in that third phase of the operation phase, that the low risk big capital should indeed be in the portfolios of pension funds. That would give you the liquidity for the public capital to actually fund the construction phase. So you can think of a, that middle phase where public risk capital is turning over relatively rapidly because it's funding uh, only, a, only a few years per uh, activity. Um, at the moment, the uh, public agencies are sitting on a big portfolio of completed infrastructure projects which are under operation and a sensible start to build the liquidity for the middle phase of construction would be if those completed projects, which are low risk already operating, were basically sold on to, uh, to pension funds. So that's disaggregating to de-risk into the, the high risk phase, the low risk phase, and then you re-aggregate that third low risk phase, the phase of operation, you can further reduce risks by bundling together a lot of operating infrastructure projects. Um, why would you want to do that? Because the whole can be made much less risky than the riskiest parts. Um, the, the, the model here um, was actually devised by the Bank for International Settlements not for infrastructure financing, but for sovereign debt. And this happened <coughs> just after the East Asian crisis, when some East Asian sovereign debt was pretty toxic. No private investor wanted to take the sovereign debt of Indonesia or the Philippines. And so the Bank for International Settlements just created a sovereign debt, an East Asian sovereign debt fund. And it put in that fund lots of good stuff that was investment grade and it also put in the sovereign bonds of Indonesia and the Philippines and the whole was classified <coughs> as investment grade and so Indonesia and the Philippines which couldn't access markets directly were able to gain to, to access markets through that Bank for International Settlements Fund. If you can do that for sovereign debt you can do that for infrastructure projects. <coughs> 
You can put African infrastructure projects together with emerging markets infrastructure projects and OECD infrastructure projects into a fund which overall is much higher uh, quality than the, uh, than the individual African components. Um, final way of de-risking is the last layer of risk in operating is who's operating it. Is it being well run or badly run? And the obvious people to run uh, African infrastructure well are the big OECD infrastructure operating companies. And at the moment they are pretty thin on the ground operating infrastructure in Africa um, and partly that is a, I think comes from their culture. Um, their culture came the, 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 it's a relatively recent phenomenon the OECD private infrastructure companies comes out of the privatizations of the last 20 years basically and so they think of themselves as operating domestically. Um, to give you an example of the fact that culturally they're just a bit slow um, look at telecoms. Uh, everybody knows what a huge opportunity the mobile phone in Africa has been. Vast amounts of money have been made. Who pioneered that? Um, Mo Ibrahim. Uh, um, Mo Ibrahim was a, a telephone engineer in Britain who recognized that Africa was a fantastic market and so he peddled the idea around the British telecoms companies saying this is a wonderful opportunity and only because he couldn't raise any private interest did he then go to public risk capital CDC and public risk capital gave him the seed money to set up Celtel um, three and a half billion dollars later the, um, the, 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 the OECD infrastructure util telephone utilities are kicking themselves. Um, one possibility would be for the infrastructure operating companies to keep African infrastructure on their balance <coughs> sheets. That would be one possible financing model. But um, in doing that, if they're only operating in one or two African countries, they're rather exposed. And the advantage of the fund model is that you, you diversify the risk. Finally, let's come to financial regulation. And pension funds are subject to tons of regulation which requires them to hold uh, uh, basically nothing lower than A minus, I think. Um, now, as, a, as, a, as somebody um, close to my pension, I value that. Right? I don't want my pension funny, my, my money poured into, in, into to the Wild West, but um, uh, I think there are a few things about regulatory environment which actually are, are deficient. Um, first, a combination of regulation and culture in the pension funds equates safety with liquidity. And if you think about it, that isn't very sensible. Um, Pension funds don't need a lot of liquidity in their assets because the, their liability structure is extremely well defined. Most of their assets they can afford to hold for a long, long time. The pension funds are at the moment in crisis not because their assets have proved to be illiquid but because their assets have proved not to have a decent rate of return. If your portfolio is stuffed with zero real return assets, you've got a nightmare as a pension fund, however liquid those assets are. And so regulation may inadvertently uh, have proved counterproductive, that it actually hasn't achieved safety in the pension funds. It's confused liquidity for safety. Um, the second uh, regulatory concern is that uniquely um, regulation of, uh, of, of portfolios gives legal force to the assessments of private commercial companies, namely the risk rating agencies. Now the risk rating agencies um, have not exactly uh, distinguished themselves for their acute um, appreciation of risk. Um, 
But in Africa, they're playing super cautious. Um, you know, the once bitten, twice shy rule, you've been bitten in the OECD, so you're very shy in Africa. So there's a rule which applies only to Africa, but not to the OECD, um, which is that any project cannot be rated more highly than the nation's sovereign debt. That rule does not apply in the OECD, but it does apply across Africa. Um, does it make sense? Well, actually the structure of risks in sovereign debt and projects are, of course, different, but it's not, it's not clear that one is superior to the other. Sovereign debt, the collateral, is the tax stream. But the risk is that that tax stream will get preempted for other uses, that the revenue stream can be preempted by other expenditures. When you move to projects <coughs> as collateral, you've got a less robust revenue stream. It's a project that's generating revenue rather than the whole tax base of the economy. But you've got a much more ring-fenced use of the revenues. Repaying the debt is the, uh, is, is the first, or, the, or the return on equity is the first call. So, um, uh, so it's not clear that project risk should be more uh, face, face the, the country's uh, sovereign debt rating as its ceiling. And indeed, if we look at practical examples, Côte d'Ivoire, during the Bagbo regime, the last decade, uh, defaulted on its sovereign debt, uh, but there are infrastructure projects which just kept paying. Okay. Does it matter, this ceiling business? Well, there are long lags in establishing a good sovereign debt rating. Um, there's conservatism and inertia in the rating agencies. Uh, if you don't believe that the uh, risk rating agencies are, have inertia, just think about why the, uh, the, the rating agencies are so badly regarded, because they were inert in the other direction. They were happily grading stuff as A the day before it went bust. That's inertia and Africa is suffering from the inertia in the other direction. Um, that ceiling um, closes off the chance of Africa leapfrogging um, a, a low sovereign debt rating by ring-fencing um, uh, particular assets. So we've been the long march through the pipeline, the de-risking, and the regulation. And the killer point is that all of these matter and that they are interdependent. Um, if you haven't got a pipeline, it's no good uh, coming up with solutions that de-risk. If you haven't got a pipeline and you haven't de-risked, it's no good trying to get the pension funds interested by changing the regulations. Because of that, there is no private impetus for fixing any of these impediments. If it was only a single impediment, the return on fixing it would be high enough for the private sector to move in and fix the problem. But if you've got multiple problems that are sufficiently distinct that different types of actor have to move in to solve them, there is no coordination problem, a process in the private sector to do that. So, to conclude, it has to be the public sector. Um, public action on infrastructure financing goes through three phases. Phase one is a recognition of the problem. The public development agencies establish IFC, CDC, FMO, MEGA, OPIC. They do something. They set up organizations to tackle the problem. They don't use them strategically, um, but they set them up. They use them for other things, so they're not properly used. Phase two, which began under the Wolfenson era, the World Bank, um, uh, you believe that actually you don't even need public involvement in private infrastructure. The private sector is going to do this. Right? The Wolfenson line was this so much private money what on earth is the World Bank doing in infrastructure? Let's move all our money 
from financing infrastructure to a social agenda. Yeah? And so the public money marches away from infrastructure. Phase three, which we're now in, there's a wake up. The private sector hasn't marched in and filled this need. So the public sector will need to do something. Um, in the lead has been diffid um, in, in two respects. One is um, uh, it reformed CDC. CDC was a, a relic which had been parked into a fund of funds model which was no use for anybody. And at this uh, podium three years ago, uh, Andrew Mitchell, then the uh, Secretary of State for Development, announced the reform of CDC. Very necessary. The other thing that DFID has done is pioneering um, the uh, private infrastructure development group, um, which is a portfolio of um, responses, which uh, I, I believe Dr. Palmer might well be talking about. Um, DFID catalyzed this. It's a consortium of donors. DFID is still funding about half of it. So DFID has a good recent record in recognizing this problem and responding to it. The problem with PIDGE is it's too small. And what's more, um, the uh, new uh, wake-up call is bypassing it. So uh, at the G8, um, where I got involved, um, the G8 woke up to this and agreed there's a, a, quite a powerful statement in the closing communique that the G8 intends to move into this space and do something about it. The G20 has just issued a communique saying the G20 recognizes it, so they're going to move in and do something about it. The African Development Bank has just launched an initiative, the Africa 50 <coughs> Fund. They're going to try and fix the problem. The um, BRICS, um, Minister Manuel was just announcing last night, reminding us that at the last BRICS meeting, they set up a BRICS development bank, which will try and get private finance for African infrastructure. Um, in July, the American government announced a Power Africa initiative, um, finance for, for, for African electricity. And the World Bank, um, in its new strategic uh, uh, management change, uh, is trying to make uh, IFC and MEGA much more strategic. So there's a lot happening. Unfortunately, we've flipped from too little happening to too much happening. Um, what is needed is for these different initiatives to be coordinated. Okay? And the big problem with international development policy coordination is that everybody's keen to volunteer as the coordinator and nobody wants to be coordinated. Okay? So the World Bank is not in a position to coordinate everybody else, nor is DFID, but tried with PIDGE. Okay? And so how do you get coordination? And I'm going to close with the suggestion there's only one way to turn this zoo into coherence, and that is a common set of intellectual framework, a common set of ideas that everybody accepts, ah yes, this is the problem, here are the solutions, let's cohere around doing that. And that common diagnostic, common solutions hasn't been available. My talk clearly isn't it, but what we at the IGC will be planning to do is try and provide such a process. The, the, um, Coming out of the G8, the Cabinet Office has asked us to actually conduct a, a sort of a set of workshops bringing in all the different players and build that uh, expertise. So let me close with an appeal to our academic community and indeed our practitioner community. Um, I am not an expert on this. You are. We need you in this process of building a coherent uh, body of, of accepted ideas. Thank you very much. Sorry, Alan. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, let's move right on to uh, Dr. Keith Palmer.
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I've been asked to be brief, um, and uh, so I'm not going to say a lot of things that could be said. I'm just going to focus on a small number of points which I think are complementary to uh, rather than repetitive of what Professor Collier has said. Uh, my background for the last 12 years is that I helped set up and have chaired various facilities within the private infrastructure development group, the PIDGE as we call it, and uh, it is designed to do exactly the sort of thing that uh, Professor Collier spoke about. That is to say, it identifies uh, mechanisms for addressing firstly the pipeline problem that he referred to, secondly the risk reduction problem that he spoke about, uh, and thirdly mobilizing capital for investment in that construction phase which is a part of the, uh, of the development cycle which um, institutional finance is very nervous about investing in. And if people are interested, since I don't have time to say any more about the PIDGE, um, uh, PIDG.org, you can find out really quite a lot. It's quite an informative website. So uh, the first thing I'll say, and very briefly, is I believe that the, the need that, um, that Professor Collier spoke about is very apparent, and the diagnosis of the constraints that have been holding back private investment are, are also um, appropriate and correct. I'm actually going to talk about something slightly different. I want to draw to your attention that actually 80% or more of all the investment that takes place in sub-Saharan Africa is undertaken by state enterprises or state agencies. Those state utilities or state agencies are characterized, and this is a generalization that is uncannily accurate, uh, with very poor governance, uh, very weak operational capacity, and terribly weak finances. They're also, for the most part, monopolies, statutory monopolies. And there's two implications of what I've just said, which I think are very pertinent to the, the discussion that was um, started with, with Professor Collier's input. The first is that if you want to do private investment in infrastructure in sub-Saharan Africa, you cannot avoid dealing with the state utilities. They are omnipresent, they have statutory monopoly rights, they are the purchaser of your output in many instances, and if they don't want you involved, they will stop you. And I think it's a very important point that most state utilities in Africa, and I've seen quite a lot of them close up, do not want the private sector investing in core strategic infrastructure assets. They're happy enough to have them fringe investors selling the output to the state monopoly, uh, but not getting into a situation where they compete with the state monopoly. And this is actually one of the most major um, deterrence to private investment. You go and see um, the, the transmission company, you want to build a power station, and they say, uh, well, we don't want you to do that. Or well, they don't usually say that. They, they say, we do want you to do that, but on conditions which make it impossible to, uh, to deliver the, the financing and the facility. And this is a very real problem because if the private sector even if it was able to get the financing to expand its activities, cannot get an accommodation with state utilities, the investment will not happen. The second implication of the dominance of state utilities is that they are hardly ever creditworthy. And when you're talking about, as we are, mobilizing institutional finance, corporate finance for state utilities is almost always unavailable because the entities themselves are not creditworthy. They're not only a little bit short, they're miles short. And the only institutional finance that you can get into uh, these utilities has to be raised by sovereigns, then channeling the funds down into the state utilities. But what we observe, and uh, you've all read, I'm sure, that uh, recently the, the window for accessing the bond markets have opened again for sovereign governments in Africa, um, that money is not necessarily being channeled into the priority infrastructure investments 
which are, are so important. And if, even if they were, there's an argument about whether the money would be well spent given the weaknesses on both governance and infrastructure uh, and operational uh, effectiveness that I spoke of earlier. So uh, I've just got two other things that I want to say. One about mobilizing institutional finance into the private sector, very much addressing the, the topic that, um, that Professor Collier was speaking directly about. And that is, I think there is one at least practical near-term means of mobilizing institutional finance into these uh, situations, into these infrastructure investments in, in Africa. It may not be the only one, but it's the one I believe is, if there's any sort of quick wins, uh, this is it. The development finance banks around the world, both the multilaterals and the bilaterals, have been investing heavily in infrastructure with limited resources, but nonetheless they are an important player given the difficulties that the private sector have had of raising finance. They are investing through the construction phase where the institutions will not go, but they're hanging on to those investments uh, post-completion once the operating phase is reached. But actually, the effective way of using public money is to commit it to the early stage where the construction risks are large. As soon as you get to the operational phase, do what Professor Collier was recommending, which is to bundle them up to sell those assets to institutions and to re-mobilize the capital you receive for that back into doing more of the front-end stuff which the institutions will never be prepared to do at all and which the commercial banks are, are nervous about doing uh, in more than uh, very special circumstances. The other thing I want to table is that even if the proposals that have been spoken about were successful, even if you had an explosion of investment by the private sector in infrastructure, because they're only 20% of the market, you won't get the transformational impact which is certainly needed. To do that, you have to find a way of reaching accommodations with the state utilities, but in a way that you can be assured of better governance, efficient implementation, and uh, a sustainability, and I mean sustainability both in the financial sense and in the environmental and social sense. I think there's an interesting debate to be had, um, which would be uh, for donors who want to see increased infrastructure investment, luring state utilities into strategic partnerships with the private sector on the basis that if they agree to allow the expertise and operational expertise of the uh, private sector to be deployed in their strategic assets, then um, guarantee facilities which redu reduce the cost of capital and therefore reduce the cost of services to the populations who benefit from the services would be, would be passed on. The, the, the benefit of the guarantees would be passed on to the users. It is just possible that if you were to package up a deal that said uh, we're prepared to lower your cost of capital to, uh, to mobilize strategic infrastructure investment, uh, that they, some of them at least in some countries would be prepared to, to create this strategic partnership which would allow the expertise and finance from the private sector to be mobilized on a larger scale and under lower costs. I think I've probably used up all my time. Thank you, Keith. Uh, Antonio Estash is the third um, speaker. So uh, I used to be at the World Bank, and I was not allowed to be politically incorrect. I'm no longer with the World Bank, so I can be politically incorrect, and I'll be particularly incorrect. So we've heard, um, we heard two sets of, uh, of, uh, of perspective, I guess, which are quite complementary on, on, on infrastructure finance in Africa. Um, my, my sense is um, that we need a lot more time to be able to say everything else goes wrong. 
there are many, many issues that, that need to be fixed. There are many things that are going a lot better than, than they were about 10 years ago. But to be able to get to, to serve the people who need the most, which I guess are the poor, is still far, 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 far a long way from there. So let, let me just pick 10 things which seem to me to matter quite a bit. When Tony asked me to put together this presentation, I came up with a list of 20. And then it kept shrinking the time I was allowed to talk, so I had to pick something. Um, well, the first thing that I would like to say, so it's a list of 11 for my 10 points. The first thing is that uh, we still don't know what we're doing. I mean, we've been measuring things a little bit better because of AICD and because of those things. We have a sense now, so now political politicians can, can tell you this is how much we need, more or less. But plenty of other things we don't know. I mean, the performance of the sector, we don't know. The quality of the services that we're getting for public enterprises, we don't really know. So, um, you know, it seems quite convenient. We don't measure things, right? You don't have to be held accountable for them. Uh, I think that's part of the problem. The second thing I would like to pick up is something that Paul said earlier, that uh, there's this big confusion between this, you know, the economic perspectives of, of return. I mean, basically, the, f the economics and the finance, right? When you try to get the private sector involved in, in, uh, in uh, in financing infrastructure for very obvious and very rational reasons. I mean, they're concerned with the private return. And you've heard some of the numbers, right? I mean, we're talking about uh, the cost of capital of roughly, what, 18, 20, 25 percent? That's uh, three to four times what the return they would get in the U.S. or in the U.K. Uh, what people tend to forget is, as a and this is my second point, and I'll come back to the first point for a second, is getting the private sector involved is not cheap. And if you think about what it means, right, having a cost of capital, a rate of return required by these companies, which is about four times as big as what you would get here, implies that the average tariff is going to be about four times. Okay, four times the higher <coughs> tariff. Isn't that the region where we have so many poor? So you have this mismatch between what the financing dimension of investment demands, if you think about it in terms of the private perspective, right, and the social concerns that you have to have. So yes, we need the private sector. Yes, we need to be able to consider the fact that they have concerns and that they will not invest if they don't get a fair rate of return. But we cannot afford to forget that that rate of return may have consequences we don't want to have, you know, we don't want to have in those countries. So that's a bit I mean, serious issue. What's the related problem? So I want to have the private sector involved. They want to have a higher rate of return. So basically I'm restructuring my deals, I'm restructuring my sectors in such a way that I allow them to do cream skimming. I don't know if you know what cream skimming is. The good deals go to you know, the, those people who want to get a high rate of return, and then the state gets stuck with the rest of it. But before you unbundle those things, right, you have cross-subsidies. So your average tariffs can be sort of reasonable in that sense. I'm not saying that this is a, the, the perfect solution because we've been trying that for a long time. But you cannot forget that unbundling in order to be able to, get, to attract the private sector is not going to be <coughs> cheap to the taxpayer. Uh, so that's my, 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 my two sets of points. The economics versus the finance and the equity considerations of allowing cream skimming. The third point is that I, know, I work for, I don't know, about 15 years on, on uh, concession contracts and things like this. And, uh, wow, cheap talk is the fashion. I mean, we come up with, I mean, I've seen contracts in which they forgot to erase the name of the country for uh, a contract in which the, this contract was used before. So you were working on Mali and, oops, Côte d'Ivoire. No, no, it's not Côte d'Ivoire. You know, a lot of the stuff is, is sort of prepackaged, and, and this is one of the concerns that I have with standardization, right? The temptation of getting into things which are easy to implement to be able to go fast may lead to, a, 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 to forget that, that you know, many of those countries are not the same. I mean, tolerance is probably what characterizes Africa to a large extent. Mali is not South Africa. Niger is not Kenya. And so sort of being able to recognize this in the design of the contracts is something that seems to be quite important also, which is not being done. And, uh, and w w one tiny stat statistical information, 80% of all the private money that goes to Africa in infrastructure goes to sex countries. Well, I have a bunch of other countries I want to help too, right? So, I mean, yes, getting the private sector is important, but you, you, know, you need to see, see that, that it's not going to go everywhere. So I've made my, my fifth point on the, on the poverty of the contract. A few points on regulation which have also been made, but what we do know, there's plenty of good theoretical research, there was plenty of good empirical research that tells you that <coughs> importing the regulatory 
models from OECD countries is a pretty stupid idea most of the time. It doesn't work. And getting to, uh, to, to some degree of adjustment within each one of the countries, within a country actually, across sectors, it may be needed to, 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 uh, to, to, to I mean, adjustment may be needed. And, and, and depending on what the major institutional weakness that you're going to have in a given country, going for a price cap or a cost plus actually may be the best strategy, but it has to be targeted to the institutional weakness that you have. So the specific design of regulation is, has to be anchored to a diagnostic. It cannot be a bread and butter. It cannot be something which is imported from everywhere. My seventh point, it's a brutal, not very nice point. I apologize for this, but I do need to say it. Uh, I've been sitting in meetings in which many of the consultants who were providing advice didn't know what they were talking about. So everybody keeps saying, yeah, skill requirements, yeah, skills are not good. I mean, these are people, you know, you don't have that many people with the, the, the right cap human capital yet, and they're building up, and you have, but I'm, I'm thinking about Mali. Many people on the Malian side of the negotiation were a lot more educated on the issues they had to deal with than the French who were sitting on the other side and the World Bank staff that was sitting <coughs> on the other side. So the skill issue is something that we, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm worried in, in a sense because I, what, I'm, what I'm arguing is, is that, um, that we haven't really thought about the skills of the advisors. And yes, we need to sort of come up with, with good technical assistance. And yes, we need to work on, 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 on building up the institutional capacity. But who is doing it? I mean, we have way too many generalists who improvise themselves specialists on regulation all of a sudden and provide bad advice. Why is it that we have such a high rate of renegotiation in contracts? Because they were poorly designed, because you know, they were based on poor advice. That's a major issue. We don't talk about that. We just, you know, we have to do more of those things, more contracts, more this, more that. Homework first, I would suggest. Now let's assume that we don't deal with the private, we're not dealing with the private sector and we are sticking with the very large public enterprises that are going to continue running this business for a long time simply because that's the nature of things, right? I mean, private sector is at most financing 20% of this today of infrastructure investment and since we know that the actual investments are twice what they're doing, it means that the actual percentage financed by the private sector is 10%, okay? So we stuck with the public sector. Well, the big word in the public sector is procurement. And in many of those countries, procurement is pretty standardized. I mean, they're applying World Bank rules with the World Bank has been able to sell to all of the other multilateral and many bilateral are adopting. And I have a list here that I cannot read to you because, I, I mean, I'm going to be killed because I'm talking for too long, I know. <coughs> I'm doing fine, so. Let me just give you a list of things that don't, that don't really work. So when they're setting up the procurement process, right, the first thing that they have to figure out is how much do they need and what do they need it for, right? So they come up with this incredibly optimistic forecast for demand. Everybody will want everything we're providing them. We forget to mention that at any price, maybe one implicit assumption, of course, once people have to pay, they don't want what they said they, they would want, right? So a bias on the, optimi on, on the demand side, which is optimistic, and a bias on the cost side, which is pessimistic. We have an incredibly high percentage of cost overruns in this industry. I mean, there's a very smart guy at Oxford who's doing a, a living out of this, uh, Flightberg. I mean, mega projects are very costly, and, and we're still not correcting this. And I've been seeing this for the last 15 years, and there's no change. I mean, uh, well, you know, the Brits know it too. I mean, uh, <laughs> railway problems are not minor in that respect. Cost overrun is something that we, we can't seem to be able to fix. It may not matter that much to England, but it matters a lot when you need about 100 billion to be able to deliver the infrastructure that you want on an annual basis. In many cases, we have sole source awards. I mean, there's no competition because the rules, the procurement rules are so complicated, so demanding that you're going to have repeated players who know the country well, right? And it becomes inertia, right? And, and they don't do what's the interest of the country. There are easy things. I mean, procurement theory has improved so much in the last 15 years or so. Many countries have adopted the changes that are allowed by this new theory. The World Bank hasn't done anything. Most international organizations haven't done anything. And because countries who borrow from these organizations are stuck with those procurement rules, they're not going to do anything either. This is costing them at least 10% per, uh, in, I mean, in terms of the total cost of what they have to, 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 to pay for every year. 
there are a bunch of, of really good empirical pieces which have been delivered over the last three years on this topic. You know, the evaluation criteria are distorted. Uh, there are biases against local firms for a bunch of reasons. And so when you're saying we're going to build up the capacity, yeah, but the procurement process doesn't allow to build up the local capacity. How do you reconcile those things? I mean, the list is really, really long. I mean, you have lots of political interference, and I agree totally with Mr. Palmer. I mean, we're being told who we have to play with. And if you're getting your funding from, well, let's pick two countries randomly, from the French or from the Spaniards, right? The chances of having a French uh, company winning the contract is very, very high. And if you're getting the Spanish money, the chance of having a Spanish company is very, very high. So Tide A does not completely disappear from these things. And it's a major issue. And nobody wants to talk about it, of course, right? And let's talk, I mean, let's not talk about collusion and things like that. My next point. Also picking up on some of the stuff that, that Paul was saying. If, I mean, I, I spent part of my weekend, well, part of it was reading Paul Collier, and the other part was trying to look at how many infrastructure funds do we have in Africa. Um, man, we have quite a bit. I mean, we have quite a few of them, and uh, you know, the African, Investment Bank, uh, African Development Bank has put together a very interesting fund. But when you look at how much money they're trying <coughs> to get, right? I mean, what they're managing to get is not even half of what you need on an annual basis. So these funds are quite useful, but if they lead me to do the cream skimming I was talking about, I'm not that excited about it. So at least you're going to have to have safe, some safeguards to make sure that these funds do the right thing for the right people. Otherwise, we're going to do, and it's going to be business as usual, which you don't really want. Okay? Um, and again, I mean, we're talking about countries which are not... <coughs> Yet Korea, there are no Chile, right? So the, the issues are going to be quite serious on that front. So I guess I've, you know, I've covered most of the things that I wanted to say in my short list. Let me just say two more things and then, and then I'll leave you alone. Um, who got it wrong? Actually, who got it wrong? It's like, you know, I mean, I don't know if you have this game in, in, in anglo Saxon. We have Cluedo in, in, you know, you're trying to find the killer. I have six potential killers, the countries, the donors, the investors, the users, the operators, and of course the academics. <laughs> uh, we're all guilty. We have the same knife. You just, we just use it differently, I think. And I think that's part of the problem. I think a mea culpa, a collective mea culpa may not be a bad idea on this front. I, I don't want to leave you, you know, with, with a completely negative picture of the whole thing. I mean, th there are solutions. I could make it darker, but I mean, you have to stay longer. <laughs> uh, you know, light is my specialty. I turn it off and that's it. Uh, so the market potential is big, honestly. I mean, this is, I mean, the middle class is exploding right now. We have plenty of things which are happening. The ability to pay is less of an issue. Also, you still have a very strong percentage of the population who does not have the ability to pay. And this, if you work on regulation, you know it's a major issue because you're going to have to have cross-subsidies or direct subsidies if you want. But if you don't have a tax base, you cannot do direct subsidies. So plenty of very technical stuff which are very, very, very easy to implement, actually. But for some reason, we don't go because you have plenty of ideology also in the back against cross-subsidies and things like that. Uh, everybody assumes we're in a first-best world, and we're very far from the first-best world when we do policy in this country. Anyway, I mean, there are things that we can do. Uh, there are things that we can avoid because we understand them better. I mean, there are a few things that we've learned in over the last five or six years. And let me just give you three sets of ideas. I want to say something about cost recovery. I want to say something about financing. And about, I want to say something about the sustainability of any type of change that people decide democratically. On the cost recovery side, I think one of the things we haven't really talked about is, uh, so far is the, the diaspora. I mean, you have a very large number of Africans who don't live in Africa with a significant capacity to contribute to the investment requirements. I'll give you one example of a project I was working on in the Dominican Republic and a few other places in Central America for other than, in a much more narrow way. But this is what we used to do. And I, you know, I tried this in Africa, and, and my, I mean, task managers in the regions were not very excited about it, but it worked in some other parts. We would make deals with the relatives in New York, in Miami, in Washington, D.C., in Houston, in Los Angeles. And what we would do would sort of sell very basic units, right? Uh, for instance, if, you want to, if you, your family lives in a rural area, a solar panel, you get a fridge, you get a radio, you get six, six bulbs, right? It's quite feasible, and it's not that expensive for about 1,500 
dollars probably you can get you know your relatives sort of getting sorted out in terms of capital expenditures right who pays for it the relatives so we would have this deal in which we would send the bill the bills would be sent actually to the relatives in the US um, I tried to set up a business like this one with a friend from Senegal and it was extremely complicated because um, as Mr. Palmer was saying getting anything changed in, in you know when you have a public enterprise is quite difficult but I think the, the, the potential for using the diaspora <coughs> To finance a big part of the need is something that you should not forget. I mean, people in the country will not be able to cover bills which are consistent with the rate of return that private companies or public companies for that matter need. But getting some co-financing from relatives is possible. I'm from Spanish origin. My mother used to send money to pay for the bills of her relatives in Spain. This is not new. I mean, this is something that has been done for a long time and you can work on this stuff. I think it's also important of, of financing. But I mean, uh, the, the point that I would like to make in terms of, of financing on a, on, a, you know, on a broader set of, of issues, I think it's very sad that we don't have more creat creativity in very Mickey Mouse type of solution. But these Mickey Mouse types of solution work quite well, actually. Because right now we're trying to get to perfection, and perfection takes time. And we're never going to get there. As Paul was saying, eight years is a long time small-scale solution. I mean, an example that comes to mind for those of you who know a bit about Hydro, Inga. I don't know if you've heard about the project. You know, it's a never-ending project. We've been talking about this project for the last 50 years, and we're coming back with another, you know, with another run right now, and it's another set of commitments. I have one student who did his master's thesis on the topic. We tried to look at the alternative. Coming up with, my, you know, with mini Hydro would no, we'd get us a lot faster where we want to be. Yeah, I mean, it, it would work, actually. The rate of return is totally rational. He went, he made a presentation in the, in the parliament in Congo. It was great. He got, you know, people said it was great, but <coughs> the rest it was business as usual. So it's not, you know, it's not moving along. And finally on sustainability, one very, very, con I mean, you know, on, on the financing, all these ideas of special funds and trying to aggregate these funds and try to come up with something which I think makes a lot of sense. But then we need to think about the sustainability. So we, we're coming up with creative solutions. We're setting up cool funds, right? How do we make sure that these things don't disappear within the next five years? Because something happened. We have a crisis, we have a political shift, we have whatever happens, right? Well, there are a few things that we could do that will not change. And I'm, I would like to come back to the skills issue because I do think that a big part of the problem when implement, you know, in trying to do deals and structural reforms in many of the countries has to do with the lack of skills or proper skills for the people who provide the advice. M my suggestion would be to try to come up with a pool of real experts, real experts. Not people who sell, I mean, you know, we have plenty of legends in their own mind in the world. We, we, we don't want that. We want people who, you know, who know how to do the stuff. We get them in the UK. We get them in Holland. We get them in many countries. How come we cannot afford to get these people into the countries where they are probably needed <coughs> most? The social rate of return of using these guys there is going to be a lot higher than using them here. And it's the same tax money it's paying for them. Mm. Why not using them more? Thank you very much. Okay, we have uh, five or ten minutes for questions. There are roving microphones. If uh, people can put their hand up if they want to ask a question, say who they are, and please ask questions rather than make long statements. Uh, there's one right in the middle there, then one down here. Um, and then there'll be two on the right-hand side. But let's take these, these couple. Thank you so much for your comments. This has been really interesting. Uh, Dr. Collier, I had a question about your new venture. Um, I was wondering if you had worked towards finding a market index for infrastructure projects. Um, because, you know, if we want to, if we consider structuring like the private sector, we, investors need more information on the return on investment on these great projects. That, you know, there is a return on investment in some of them, and there's just not concentrated information. Hmm. Yeah, um, down here. So we'll tell, take three or four and then uh, yeah, do, a um, two, do a couple of rounds of questions. So let, let's have the first three or so. Uh, I work for a, a lending bank and my day job is lending into African projects. So I've got a lot of experience with this and I come from a PPP background in the UK. I grew and developed the team here over 15 or 20 years. So I thought PPPs would be good in Africa. Of course they're not. It's dysfunctional. It doesn't work here and it won't work there and we need a new model. 
And I think what Professor Colley is talking about, indeed all of the uh, excellent uh, speakers are talking about, is finding this new model. How are we going to do that? Well, as far as I'm concerned as a lender, uh, we, um, uh, we're, we're interested in providing liquidity. The development banks don't have the balance sheets to provide that sort of liquidity. The African Development Bank reckons it's lent up to $10 billion in terms of infrastructure over the past year or two. Now, if you're looking at $100 billion, that's nothing from the premier development bank in the region. So this liquidity has to come from commercial banks. These, these loans have to be de-risked. <coughs> the de-risking has got to come from a AAA balance sheet like MEGA. And so we're all doing the wrong things. Banks like mine are sitting on our hands. The de-riskers are trying to lend into all the projects they can find because generally they're staffed by secondees from banks like mine and who are paid bonuses like, like uh, we all are. Um, but the fact is that um, is this model is not working. So we have to change it. I'm delighted to hear IGC is pursuing this, this, uh, this program. We'd be very happy to participate, uh, but we need to get there quickly. This is an urgent problem, uh, and I'm very keen to find the answer. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there's one, one, one there, then we'll take a second round. Over. Yes. Um, Professor, uh, you did not mention the Chinese, except to talk about, mm. you know, um, how come the Chinese are able to move so fast? Between the time the president talks to the Chinese and the time they mobilize, nine months. Mm. Now, eight years, traditional sources of funding. Also, what about the banking crisis? Do you think that uh, led to delays? Are the banks more cautious now than before? Um, and then just um, uh, the business of the skills. Uh, in a way, you are right, but most of these big projects, they are peddled by people who come from outside. You know, fly-by-night investors, the type you say that confuse sometimes the names, they are supposed to have those skills. So the solution should really be with them. Maybe you should be inviting the private sector to come together and see how they can move uh, faster. And finally, yeah, uh, the last gentleman spoke about Mickey Mouse stuff. Um, you know, these small projects, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking big projects. And this small is not going to help. And please be careful about these uh, diaspora remittances. <coughs> they are mainly for consumption, especially in poor countries. You can't, it's not fungible. It's, you, can't, you, move, you can't move it to large uh, investments. I'll ask each of the panel to respond to uh, one or more of those questions. But we will get another round in. Paul. Yeah, um, great. I mean, the... the it, the idea of getting concentrated sort of market index information seems to me a good one and it should be doable from the existing portfolios of the, um, of the development banks, if nothing else. They're sitting on uh, a lot of completed projects that presumably have a rate of return and if we aggregated those, that would be information. Now, um, as Antonio says, there's, there's no way on earth these are going to yield the sort of 20% fancy stuff. Um, and so, so we, I mean, that's why I focus so heavily on de-risking, um, because it's, it's completely unviable trying to get uh, private finance in at 20%. We've got to get private finance in at sort of 6% or something, you know, so it's something that is doable, that is consistent uh, with, with, uh, with, with, with reasonable pricing. Um, but I think an index would, would, be, would actually sound to me, to me a good idea. Um, Finding a new model and keen to participate, yes, please. Um, uh, uh, make sure that we, we get your coordinates at the end because, of course, um, the key players in this are going to be the private sector. Um, uh, the, 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 the private sector has to be, the private financial sector, the commercial banks, have to be uh, the, uh, the test bed of is, is, is this going to work. And as you say, we haven't at the moment got a model which is close to working. I think that was the... The, 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 the import of, of Antonio's message, we're a long way uh, from something that works. Um, the Chinese, um, why did I not mention them? Um, uh, I mean, they're the major player. They're the major beneficiary, in a way, of total failure, of the fact that the development banks marched away from infrastructure into social, that the private sector didn't move in, that Africa has acute needs, where is Africa turn other than the Chinese role? And as a, at the moment, that's very unhealthy 
um, because they're, they're too close to being a monopoly. As you say, if you want the stuff done in finite time, it's China or nobody. Uh, and so it's important that we get a viable uh, private sector involvement so that there's some genuine competition. There's a choice of uh, a funding route. Um, uh, and the, the development banks at the moment are a, a, a long way from that. Um, has the crisis made the banks more cautious? Um, well, actually, I don't think it... I mean, in a, in a sense, it didn't, really. I think that where did, it, where did a tidal wave of private finance go post-financial crisis? It went into emerging markets. It didn't go into the frontier markets. It didn't go into Africa, except for mining. But it did go into the emerging markets. So um, I don't think, in a way, they... What, what happened was that the, the, the financial sector reassessed the risks within the OECD and said, oh, goodness, this is a much scarier place than we'd thought. Um, uh, I, I should, I should, I'll stop there. I'm going to take another round of questions and then work back the other way. So you can, you can answer some of them. Like people dribble down the end. You like, you like those. You've got longer to think about them. Okay, so quickly, another, so, so one there, one in the front, one in the middle. Yep, right there. Oh, two there, okay. It can be um, very quick. Hi. Uh, I uh, used to be a fund manager in emerging markets, quite a large fund management company, um, and uh, was the major um, or the senior portfolio manager. Um, and one thing that I think is missing and was missing um, in what you're talking about is um, the role of the banking system in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, you're not going to get anywhere if you don't have medium-term finance available in the private sector within the banking system within Africa. Um, and you really need to start to develop those domestic capital markets to have any chance. Um, I wonder what you thought about that. There's one right behind you, one in the middle. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Peter D'Souza. I'm an economic advisor at, uh, at DFID. Um, <coughs> Professor Colley, you, you talked about uh, political risk and you know, there's MEGA, no pickers potential agencies to help address that. Um, you didn't mention disaster risk, catastrophe risk. Uh, you, know, you might get a situation where there's an earthquake or a flood which severely damages infrastructure, um, and that's also the time that government has a lack of money. Um, so you know, something we're looking at at DFID at the moment is um, trying to put in place um, some disaster insurance. Okay. Do, do you think this is a binding constraint? Right, there's one in the middle down here. Two in the middle. Very quick, please. Maureen C. Kim Fajoku, an MSc student at SORAS. Um, Professor Koloya, you mentioned that with regards to the high risk, that political risk insurance could be used to um, reduce that risk. I agree with that. But you also mentioned that projects could be rebundled and disaggregated that. Isn't that in direct conflict with, the, with your first point about a, a small pipeline? It will be very difficult, I think, to rebundle projects if there's a very small pipeline of those projects. Okay. In addition, don't you run into the risk of bundling projects that are unviable as a means of trying to de-risk them. So we start collecting projects that are on their own, unviable, and we repeat the, the problem that we had in the United States where we were aggregating very, very risky real estate assets. Mm -hmm. So that might be also a way of actually increasing the risk, I think. Great. And one in the... Thank you. Um, one has to... Um, put back a, a sense of deja vu, I think, because I think people with a, a sense of history will remember that the last time the G G8 presidency was held by the UK, we had the Commission for Africa, we had the establishment of the Infrastructure Consortium for Africa to stimulate uh, infrastructure investment uh, across the continent. And my question is, what's different now? We've had, uh, thanks to uh, the World Bank and uh, Antonio Estash, the Afro uh, Infrastructure Country Diagnostics, we've got a much greater emphasis now on the private sector, and we've got a whole range, a menu of different instruments, but getting these to work better in, in coordination. I think uh, mobilizing the, the domestic uh, uh, finances, the local banks, uh, addressing the short tenor, um, looking at long-term guarantees for revenue. And the second point I'd like to make is a small can also be big because uh, there's, uh, I think if we look at the telecom sector and the emerging uh, energy sector, there's uh, a lot of scope around small uh, off-grid, mini-grid and smart 
connections to actually scale up and deliver large-scale benefits to lots of people, but actually using a scale which can tap into the, uh, the, the risk um, appetite of the local markets as well. Thank you. Good. Well, I'm going to let this run over by three or four minutes, as you can tell. But that leaves one or two minutes for responses, starting with Keith. Oh, it's hard to choose amongst those. Um, I, I think I'd, I'd just briefly say on China. China has got a completely different business model. All the finance that's flowing into Africa for infrastructure is government to government deals that are tied to, in almost every case, access to natural resources. It's tied to supply by um, Chinese suppliers of goods and services. Uh, and it is very cheap and it is very long term. Uh, and it is. Um, it is ex extremely attractive to, uh, to governments in, in Africa. If there was enough of it, I suspect that would be the first choice. Um, the downside is, well, it is tide aid. Uh, it, the downside is the technologies are not always by any means the um, state of the art. Um, and the, the, um, the tendency, not in every single case, but the tendency is to build the asset and go home rather than to create a sustainable business um, operated and managed by, by, by Africans. Um, but actually the Chinese finance, which is very important to Africa, is a, in a way an additional constraint to uh, getting governments and state enterprises to, to accommodate the very different requirements of capital from Western capital markets, so uh, it um, makes it more difficult to, to persuade them to adapt the way um, they resist private sector in some cases. The, the only other um, point I've got time to refer to is to uh, about the banking crisis. Um, immediately after 2008, there was undoubtedly a significant short-term withdrawal of capital flows to uh, most of the emerging markets, but particularly to, to Africa, and we observed much greater difficulty for a number of years. Uh, the problem now has changed, but in a way has become worse, which is that since regulators are now imposing uh, very stricter, much stricter regulation on the capital requirements of banks, it is very, very expensive for them to allocate any of their balance sheet to these markets, and, and so the amount of, of credit and the cost of the credit um, has, got, um, has moved in adverse direction uh, even since sort of 2009-2010. Uh, well, the BAS4 actually is going to be hurting PPP in Europe as well, <laughs> for yeah, the same reasons. Much more in <laughs> yeah. uh, on, on, um, on, uh, let me just focus on the small scale stuff to answer two questions. Uh, uh, to me, what, matter, what the advantage small has over big, I don't think it's going to cover everything, but you can get things done faster. I own water pumps and I own generators in various African countries because I bought them with friends whose family was tired for the, you know, that, that, you know, that the public enterprise were never delivering what they were saying they were going to be delivering, or the public, the privatized companies at some point. If you live in rural areas, I mean, small scale solutions are not a bad idea. You don't have to wait that long. And eventually, because the asset life is a lot shorter, right, you'd be able to join the bandwagon for bigger things. But, but that's on, um, one point we haven't really talked about, and it wasn't my 20 list, but I think it makes sense given some of the questions. Um, a big part of the debate in uh, OECD countries is uh, why do we have to have uh, such a strict view of what the debt ceiling should be, right? Uh, and we have the same, you know, we've had the same story in Africa for a long time. The average debt ratio is about, what, 14, 50, 40 and 50 percent right now? If you're looking for money to find long-term investments, which are going to have a rate of return in terms of the growth rate of the country, which is quite high, it's likely to be, that growth rate is going to be higher than the real rate of interest that you'll be paying on borrowing more. Why not thinking about using that as a solution? Thank you. Last word, Paul. Um, yeah, let, let me just pick up on the, 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 the rebundling, but there's a small pipeline. So how do you rebundle it? And, and that is the chicken and the egg problem is indeed what I 
try to, to get over is that um, uh, um, there are a series of interdependent problems. And so the only way of addressing the problem is, is a coordinated push on a lot of different fronts. Um, and that's hard. It won't happen with private initiative. It won't happen without a common uh, intellectual framework that diagnoses the full sweep of the problem. So what's the difference between um, G8 2005, G8 2013? G8 2005 was, let's face it, rah-rah. Right? G8 2013 was a much more serious agenda, corporate tax avoidance, um, beneficial ownership, uh, transparency and extractives and this, it was a, it, it's a more sober time. Um, we're not imagining that uh, by saying rah-rah we can fix the problem. We know it's really difficult, but we know that the rewards to fixing it are enormous. So it's time to get serious. Well, I hope that's not optimistic, though, Tom, which to ahead. I'm not quite sure. Uh, thank you for coming. Thanks to the IGC for hosting this, and thanks again to the panel.